Good morning, saints of First Christian Church. Now, the last trait of a pastor, elder, bishop, shepherd was found in verse 7. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that they may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now, we can devote an entire sermon uh, to that alone. However, I want us to continue on in the text. But before we do that, we do need to address that final trait. And it's something that we all must understand, and that is that we are ambassadors of Christ, and we represent Him in this world. This is not unfair. It's not wrong for the world to make a determination on the validity of Jesus Christ based upon the conduct of those who profess to follow Him. Think about that. I'm following Jesus but my life in no way reflects it. They're not wrong for saying, well, Jesus must not be real. Why? Because he's not real in our lives. They're not wrong for that. We are ambassadors. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. John 13, 34 through 35. A new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus is clear. You cannot act one way in the church put on a facade, put on a mask, be fake, and then act a completely different way out in the world. To live in such a way, this draws up a a troublesome question. What will we say when we stand before a holy and righteous judge, having lived one way within the church and then lived a completely opposite way outside among the world? What would we say at that point? I can tell you what he will say. Matthew 7, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because a life that is one way here and different out there, it only testifies that you've never surrendered to Christ in the first place. How can the all-powerful God of this universe who bore our sin, who slapped death right in the face, now indwells you as a believer through God the Holy Spirit and your life not radically be transformed. Not transformed so that when we're in the middle of the church we can act a certain way, but then we leave and and, and then there's no transformative power. He is all powerful and when he enters the life of a believer, he works in us, he cultivates in us, he begins weeding and pruning the things that are destructive, that are wrong, that are not pleasing in his eyes and he begins to produce fruit that is perfect. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is produced in our life, why? Because it comes from him. So we can't come here and act one way and then somehow leave the Holy Spirit at the door, and then enter our lives outside the church and act a completely different way. That's not how he works. That's not how he functions. You see, when the Lord of Lord and King of Kings enters our lives, he wages war on our depravity. We talked about this a few weeks ago. He hates sin, especially in the life of his children. Why? Because it draws us away from him. It draws us to an empty well yet again. And it's because he loves us that he does not concede any ground to sin. And in that, he will shape us into the image of Christ. Now, for some of you, you may be like myself, and that shaping takes a little bit longer than it seems like for others. Don't be discouraged by that. You see, half a step towards Christ is half a step away from Satan. Praise God for that. But a white flag means only one thing. Surrender means only one thing. The more we surrender to Christ, the more our lives will testify of his goodness, of his mercy, of his grace. And that is why we need to reclaim the name of Christ. You see, there's a lot of people out there using the name Christian. And they use this name to describe themselves, but 
It's amazing how many Christians support the LGBT agenda who deny marriage between a man and a woman, who support divorce, who support abortion, who believe that God made a mistake when he made you a man or a woman. It's amazing how many Christians reject the authority of Scripture. What's even more amazing is how many Christians speak on behalf of God when they haven't even read what he's already spoken in the first place. Where are the men and women of God who will stand up and defend their Savior and stand up and reject cowardice and say, stop dragging my king's name through the mud. You see, he is holy. He is righteous. In him there is no sin. There is no wrong. He makes no mistakes. Jesus is not a cuckold to an adulterous bride. And he's not going to return for an adulterous church. He is returning for his bride whom he has died for, who he has laid down his life, whom he has transformed, whom he has con continued to teach and, and, and direct. And as we walk more in his ways, that's the church he's returning for. That's the bride he's coming back for. Not one that is adulterous in nature. So where are the women of God, where are the men of God who are going to stand up for the name of Christ as those who profess to be Christian and yet follow and, and surrender their lives to the things that, that God hates, the sin that is tearing our culture, our world, our nation apart? When will we stand up and say, you're not of his bride. You are adulterous at heart. But if you would truly surrender... If you would truly surrender, he will make you blameless. He will make us a spotless church. He's not returning for an adulterous church. You see, he transforms, he redeems, he changes our lives for his glory. He is incredible. He will take broken vessels that are worthless and he restores them. He reshapes them. And praise God, no one is too far gone for his grace. No one will soak up all of his mercy. And to all who would surrender, who would submit to the call of God the Holy Spirit, he will change your life forever. He will save you if you would but surrender. But so many want to claim the name of Christian. That is, a follower of Christ. And there is no following taking place. It is our responsibility to take back the name of Christ and call them who are not following to follow this wonderful and perfect Savior. The glory of Jesus Christ and his redemption will shine wherever we go. That is why you cannot come here and be a certain way and leave here a different way. The only time that happens is when you're converted. Beyond that, you bear the mark of the Holy Spirit and he will work in your life here and there and he will relentlessly do so. And so the mark of a Christian is that of surrender from day one, from the first start. And we cannot hide the work that he's doing in our life. But now let's jump into the text as we read that we, uh, that we started at the beginning. So Paul's still addressing offices in the church, and we see the heart of a deacon reflected by Christ in Matthew 20. He says, But Jesus called them to him, and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but who, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came to be served, not to be served, but to serve, and you give you his life as a ransom of many. Now this portion of the sermon is going to be kind of an introduction into uh, textual criticism. The term servant, diakonos, is it's difficult to understand as we study it. Um, it's not difficult to understand, it's difficult in some aspects of interpretation because the role of a deacon or servant in the church uh, can be difficult as we establish the specifics. 
The reason is the Greek word diakonos, it means servant. And so one of the defining traits of Christendom is that we are all to be servants. But here's where we enter into a debate, and I'll just pose the question up front as we go through. And it's, can women hold the office of deacon in the church? Now, this must be wrestled with. In Scripture, we talk about this often, must be wrestled with. And so laying the groundwork, this must be said. This subject as a whole is non-essential, meaning within Christian denominations, there are differences in practices. There are denominations that say, yes, a woman can be a deacon. No, a woman cannot be a deacon. This is not a gospel issue. This is not a matter that should split the church. In fact, if the church has women deacons, they do not compromise doctrine. The reason is what a deacon is and what a deacon does. They are servants of the church. They are not teachers. Now, let's engage the text and examine uh, the debatable subject matter. The term deacon in the Greek has no feminine form. And so some will say, ah, it's masculine, see, male. Well, well, no, because Paul in Romans 16.1, he writes, I recommend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a diakonos of the church, which is at, and I totally forgot, to, forgot how to say this name. I think it's Centria. Uh, who is a deacon of the church, which is in Centria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matters she uh, may have need of you. For she herself she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. And so when we get to the word diakonos, and it's masculine in the Greek, it's also used describing women in the church. And so the question is, was Phoebe a deacon in the sense of position, or was she a deacon as a sense of Christian duty? So was she a servant in the church, as all of us should be? Or was she a deacon as a matter of office within the church? Looking further into the text, there are those who translate the beginning of verse 8. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity. Others say deacons likewise must be dignified. I believe the latter is a better translation from the Greek, being that men, or must be men, quote, is not found in the Greek text. In a moment, we'll go back and, and, and examine why the translators would put that there. One argument made by John MacArthur is found in verse 11. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. And so the, the, the Greek word here, oh, crud, I, miss, I forgot how to say this one too. I think it's, we'll just say gynecos, okay? It's not it, it's wrong. We're just going with that. Um, but it's translated woman. And it's done so over a hundred times in the New Testament. Its root word, genoi, it can be translated either woman or wife. And so the root word of this can be translated woman or wife, and that's done so just under a hundred times in the New Testament. MacArthur, MacArthur further argues, he says, why would there be qualifications for the wives of deacons and not to the wives of elders who have more important responsibility? Why would he isolate the wives of deacons and not say anything about the wives of overseers? And so I think that that is a good point. He makes another point, but I do think that it kind of raises more problems than clarification. And he addresses the term likewise. He says the use of likewise in verse 11 means we are entering into a new category because it was also used in verse 8 as a new category. Now I can track with that logic fine, but then immediately in verse 12, it says, Deacons must be husbands of one wife and a good manager, managers of their children and their own households. So Paul doesn't make any concession to women being married to one husband. Well, maybe the reason why is because it would go without saying. If you address that the man is to be a husband of one wife, then it would go without saying that she would need to be a, hus uh, a wife of one husband. I'm not sure. The argument then arises, and I believe that it holds water, is that the reason Paul says likewise is for the purpose of piggybacking both the previous statement and elders or overseers, meaning Paul is not, Paul's just broken down the office of overseer, and now as he's speaking of deacons, he's also, who are to uphold a morality of sorts, uh, this likewise, 
He is simply linking both overseers and deacons. Their wives are to conduct themselves in that way. There's, I think it holds some water, but it is difficult uh, to, to really uphold as a whole because I do think what MacArthur brings up is a very good argument. But this is not a topic that should split the church. A deacon does not hold nearly the same weight as an overseer. And this should be debated for two reasons. One, to ensure that we are being biblically responsible in practice, while at the same time, we're not restricting needlessly women's service to the kingdom of God. And to read this in English with no further study and just say, it says this, so it means this, it frankly is shallow in reasoning. We have to study the Greek. We have to look at the context therein. We have to look at the whole of a scripture. The office of an overseer is not up for debate. We have in two places, in 1 Timothy and Titus, and Paul strongly affirms that men are to be overseers in the church. Not a debate. But as we look at deacon, there seems to be a little bit more that we need to look into. There needs to be more that we wrestle with. Now, if I've proved anything as your pastor, I... I care a lot about what Scripture has to say, and I don't care if Scripture clashes with culture. Culture can get out of the way. What the Bible says is what the Bible says, and we are to uphold it. And so as Christians, our greatest fear as we wrestle with things like this is twofold. One, we don't want to become religious fundamentalists. We've all had our run-in with fundamentalists, and it's never been fun. But two, we also don't want to be compromising liberal Christians. And so I understand that. And that's the reason why this subject is one that we need to understand does not place you in either camp. I don't know if you recall, if you come on Wednesday nights, we did a series called uh, Clouds Without Water, and a gentleman, Justin Peters, walked through the false teachings of the prosperity gospel. Justin Peters believes that a deacon is to be a man. John MacArthur believes that a woman can be a deacon. Justin Peters preaches in John MacArthur's church. In fact, that's where Clouds Without Water was taught. It was in the church of Grace Community. It's not an issue that should divide Christendom. It's not an issue that should divide the church. Deacons do not teach. Deacons serve. In fact, we are. if if you ask me, let's eradicate the role of deacon at all because we all should be diakonos. We all should be servants in the church. We should all be active in serving one another. We all should bear this in our lives. The issue is not, oh, you believe this, you believe, so you're you're an apostate. You're teaching heresy. This isn't a heretical issue. Thomas Schreiner sums it up. Deacons do not teach and exercise authority, but rather help in the church's ministries. So this is something we should wrestle with. But going back to verse 8, some read, deacons likewise must be men of dignity. Now, the reason why translators would put that there is if they fall into the camp of deacons being men, all they're simply doing is trying to add clarity to the text for the reader. They're not wrong in doing this. English is a horrible language. Going from Greek to English is terrible. All right, English is lacking in so many ways, and so what they will do is they will bring clarity to a text so that those reading can understand it a little bit more. And if the translators fall into the camp that a deacon is to be a man, then they're simply trying to add clarity. They're not evil for doing this. They haven't done some wrong. God's not going to rain down condemnation on them. They're trying to bring clarity to the text. And so there's no foul play there. But we do need to address something. As Christians, we are all called to be deacons. We are all called to be servants. Servants of Christ to serve one another. See, the title of deacon or servant in the church is not one of power or prestige. It is an office of humility. The persons who are qualified for this office of deacon will embody the servanthood of a Christian to a high level in their life. But this servanthood should be reflected in the life of every single Christian. So there's the drama. I hope that spurred you to study this further. But let's read verse 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Now, addicted to wine and greedy for dishonest gain, we address within elders. 
So let's look at dignified and not double-tongued. When we see this term, this phrase, dignified and not double-tongued, they are connected traits. It's a be this, not that kind of statement. And so they build from one another, communicating the correct and proper action, meaning deacons must be dignified and honorable. The same root word here is also used for the children of an overseer in verse 4. He must manage his household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. This word communicates the result of one's character. You see, one commands respect because the foundation of one's character has already been established. A deacon is to conduct themselves in such a way that people will respect them. This leads us to the not. How does one command respect? Well, one of the ways is not being double-tongued, meaning they will, say, they will say the same thing twice. They will not say one thing to one person and then go and say another to a different person. Their words can be trusted. Now, for a moment, can we stop there? This has got to be what defines each and every one of us. Now, I get that Paul's describing the character of an overseer and deacon here in chapter 3, but apart from the gender-specific commands, Paul's just laying out how every single Christian should act, how Christians should carry themselves, right? I know this has a lot of levels to it and a lot of layers, and we're not going to be able to address, but there are all kinds of reasons why someone would be double-tongued whether it's from upbringing, conditioning, all the way down to just their own vindictiveness. Now, we can't cover all of those, but we can cover why someone would act this way. I want us to cover as Christians that we must have a consistent character. What's the knock that people have on the church? Now, I don't, I don't mean that they say, oh, there's a bunch of hypocrites in the church. That is a delusional hypocrite calling a self-aware hypocrite a hypocrite. That doesn't mean anything. You do realize that we're all hypocrites in this room, right? We, we say, this is God's standard. This is how we are to live. And do we live to it? No. We fall short. Praise God for grace. But that's the definition of a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. The, the, the real issue that you find is that it's, it's not that they're going, okay, you're, you're a hypocrite and I'm sick of it. What it is is they'll say, they will say or do one thing to your face and then they will say and do the complete opposite behind, their, behind your back. That's the accusation. Now, personally, this is one reason why I love uh, the military, police officers, firefighters, first responders, because there's something about that profession that purges out all the fluff, um, meaning they have this what you see is what you get type mentality. And I respect that, even if it's vulgar. Uh, in fact, I hate it when someone cleans up their language around me. They'll, they'll say something and then they'll go, oh, I'm sorry. And, and what I want to say is, because I was raised by a cop, what I want to say is, what, do you think I'm too, too much of a punk to be able to handle no-no words? But that would put a damper on the interaction. So instead, you say something like, look, I've stubbed my toe before words happen. But this, what you see is what you get. When Christ saves someone, and that is their demeanor, and that is their approach, he will redeem that quality, and he will bring that in. He'll iron out the rough edges, and they have this authentic demeanor about them. They don't pretend like they got it all together. They don't keep their cards close to their chest. They're open. They're vulnerable. They're honest about where they struggle. And it's authentic in nature. And this is where I want us to remain for the rest of the sermon. Authenticity. It's not just the overseers or deacons who are to be authentic. We are all as Christians to be authentic. But what does that mean? How does this play out in our lives and in the church? And so I've only selected three, but authenticity can be lived out in three ways. Authenticity must be lived out in our bearing one another's burdens. 
It must be lived out in our bearing one another's burdens. Galatians 1, or Galatians 6, 1 through 2 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on them, lest you too, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There's this church culture that is in the American church, and I'll be honest, you see it here, and that's yeah, it's nobody else's problem. It's my fault, it's my mistake, or it's my struggle. No, I don't need, I don't need to trouble anybody with it. But that's just not biblical. In fact, you're not troubling someone who is a true brother in Christ, true sister in Christ, to bear up under what you're wrestling with, whether it's a psychological issue, whether it's depression, whether it's sin. To have someone who takes you under their wing and bears it with you, that builds community, that builds discipleship. It's foolish to think that a part of our body can be hurting and yet the rest of the body doesn't feel it at all. Right now, my right shoulder is all sorts of messed up because apparently I'm 35 and can't do things anymore. I hear it's going to get worse, so yay. But to assume that my right shoulder hurts and it doesn't affect the rest of my body is foolish, is it not? I mean, going to the gym and working out is hard. I, even grabbing the bar to do squats. If your shoulder, you can't reach back. You can't do bench because your shoulder hurts. You can't do, you can't do lap pull downs because you can't lift your daggum arms over. And yet we bring that into the church and we have people who are struggling, who are going through a lot. It's as though we have a limb that has gangrene and yet they go, no, no, it's not the rest of the body's problem, even though it's going to kill the rest of the body. We can't go through our Christian faith and think that I've got this problem or I'm struggling with this or I've got this sin and I keep it to myself and we think that our church is going to flourish. We think that this body is going to thrive, that we're going to be able to grow more in Christ. We are united. We are a family. We are one body here. And if you're struggling and you're keeping that to yourself, you're only hurting the rest of the church because it's our responsibility as your brothers and sisters, to obey Christ, to live out what Christ has modeled for us, who bore our sin, our guilt, and our shame. And we are to walk in that and live that out as Christians, but you're keeping that from us. All that's going to do is deteriorate the body of Christ from within. We have to be authentic about what we're going through and allow each other to bear each other's burdens. To cast out that this is my problem garbage. And nowhere in scripture do it. It's your problem. Keep it to yourself. Shut up. What are you complaining? I don't see it anywhere. Bring that to your brothers and sisters in Christ. That we can bear up under it. Whether it's financial hardship, whether it's you're going through depression and you're struggling with something, whether it's a sin. Guys, I've been open about my struggles, and you know what that manifested in? Heather was out of town, and Steve invited himself over to watch a movie with me. That's a brother that somebody would care enough to give up their evening to go, at least I know for one evening, you're going to be all right. Bear it. Be authentic about what you're going through so that we can build up a discipleship, a brotherhood, a motherhood, a fatherhood, a womanhood in this church that we can welcome more in and have that compassion and that authenticity. Authenticity is lived out in how we speak to one another and how we interact with one another. You know, reworking an old childhood adage, if we have nothing authentic to say to one another, don't say it at all. We help no one when we spew lies. We, help, we don't help ourselves when we say, I'm doing fine, when we're not. Maybe you've been a part of that experience where you've asked somebody how they're doing. And they're at a place where the shame doesn't matter. Satan's telling them, don't tell nobody. And maybe they just answer your question the way you asked it. How are you doing? And they open up and tell you exactly what's going on. See, a lot of times when we say how you doing, it means hello. Maybe you've had that experience when you ask someone how they are and they answer it. Because they're at a place where I don't know where to go. I need somebody. I truly hope you've seen that. We help no one when we spew lies. We help no one 
when we lie to one, one another. I saw a funny comic this last week of a guy as he's walking out of the church, preacher's at the back door, and he goes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Hey, good sermon, preacher. I did it again. <laughs> Some of y'all get it. He's like, I'm, I'm finally going to tell him it wasn't a good sermon. Good, good sermon, preacher. Nope. Look, I know I'm not hitting them out of the park. All right, we're good. But we should be able to approach one another. And it doesn't mean it's got to be public. It can be, very, it can be discreet. That we can take someone aside and, and, and bear each other's burdens and confess. In fact, it says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Maybe you see someone who is in Christ, who is struggling, and it's obvious. It's your responsibility as a body of believers to approach them and go, Hey, I want to enter into whatever you're going through right now. I want to be with you in this. I see this happening. I see it manifesting in this way. I see you struggling. I want to be in this and a part of it and be there for you. We're responsible for one another. Third, authenticity is lived out through our sanctification in Christ. It is lived out in our sanctification in Christ as Christ works in us. He makes us more and more into his image. And if there was one thing Jesus was, he was authentic. We will live out our faith no matter where we are, no matter where we go or where we work. Nothing will prevent us or deter us from following Christ. Nothing. In fact, we look at Paul's life. What did this life do? This life took his freedom. How many times was he in prison? Took his sleep. How many times did he go without sleep? Took his comfort. He was shipwrecked multiple times. Took actual pieces of his flesh. Took countless meals. It, the list goes on. Just read 2 Corinthians 11. This life took so much from Paul. And yet, he still lived out his sanctification in such an authentic way that it not only drew people to Christ, but infuriated the religious. Our lives should reflect that as well. It should also reflect that it didn't matter what the culture said. He wasn't going to back down from living out his faith, even if it meant prison. I don't know what's going to happen in the near future. I do have a, a deep burden for teachers because this is something that you see happening around the country and you're fearful that maybe it'll come here regardless of governor, regardless of mayor, that it may come here to the school boards, that they're going to push this agenda that compromises the natural order of life and so you start to, and, and they tell you, lie to the kids. Tell them there's something that they're not. You're fearful of that. But let's say it does. Will the Christian stand up and say, I don't care if it means I lose my job. I am not going to lie. Or whether it's in your work. I know there's a lot of stuff that goes on within the workplace. that They're trying to tell you to, 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 to be, they, they, they say, what's the word? Not understanding. Somebody help me out. What's that? Compromise. What? Say it again. Tolerant. That's why I don't, that's why I, didn't, I forgot it. <laughs> be more tolerant. They put it under that umbrella. Should we be tolerant? Absolutely. But that's not what they're asking for. Tolerant under that umbrella is, listen, shut your mouth and don't you say a word. It's like the judgment-free zone at Planet Fitness. You got to judge someone in order to judge them a lunk, yet it's a judgment-free zone. That's beside the point. Every single Christian should be described in one word, authentic. People will not always agree with you. People will write you off as a Christian because they have a preconceived notion. You may be called ignorant names by some, but one thing that they should call each and every one of us is authentic. Christ works in each of us, and through God the Holy Spirit, we are shaped into an authentic person. In a world filled with nothing but lies, we have social media. It's just another way to make the world perceive that you have it all. Look how vibrant my life is, and yet so many are dead inside. In a world filled with filters and Photoshop, 
It's far worse now, but I remember going all just back to the 90s. I almost said all the way back to the 90s. That hurt. Going back to the 90s, Cindy Crawford was notorious for saying, Cindy Crawford does not look like Cindy Crawford. And so let me pose this question to you, church. In, a, in our world, which is growing in discontentment with all the lies and all the falsehood, when people walk through these doors hoping that there's something, something here that the world cannot offer, they're looking for at least authenticity. What would happen if they saw a body of believers who were authentic, who bore one another's burdens? We express where we need help. We correct in love. We foster relationships that sharpen one another. Do you know what that does? It shows Christ. It shows that what he has done in our life. It's because Jesus saved me. Be, because he entered into my life. Because he shapes me and sanctifies me. He has saved me from lies. He has saved me from keeping this crud inside. He saved me from isolation. Christian, Jesus saved us from so much more than just hell. And some of you may be able to resonate with this because he saves us from ourselves. Our sinful nature is self-destructive. And that's exactly what Satan wants. Keep us from God because we will eventually self-destruct upon ourselves. And when God enters into our life, he not only saves us from an eternity that we deserve, gives us an inheritance that we don't, he saves us from us here and now. That we would stop destroying ourselves and one another. We were on the fast track of self-destruction and then Jesus, like a SWAT team, kicked in the door of our life and began working in us. And he is the only Savior to step down into our mess. Jesus took us who were once his enemies and adopted us as sons and daughters. Who does that? Only a God who is all-powerful could do such a thing. He brought you and I into a new standing. He gave us a new name, a new inheritance. So why is being authentic so difficult? It's not. If we would just surrender. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you, you give us opportunities to wrestle with, with subject matter that is difficult, that as leaders in the church we would wrestle with it, that we would make sure that each and every person within your bride would serve your church, serve this community, and serve your kingdom to the best of their ability with the gifts you've given them. But Lord, we also thank you that your word is convicting, that as we read throughout your word, we see nothing but authenticity from you to your followers, to the apostles, Every single hero in all of Scripture is tarred and feathered, and no one has a problem with it. There's only one who comes out clean, and that is you, our holy and perfect Savior. And yet, such people like Paul are not afraid to express and record what they did wrong. Father, work in us that we would have authenticity in our lives, that we would not be shy to open up about what we're struggling with whether it's sin, whether it's, whether it's dealing with mental struggles or, or financial struggles, that we would at least bring it to the church, that we would be honest about what we're going through, that we can bear up under that, bear with each other, and be a, a body here, that we would be true brothers and sisters. Cultivate in our hearts that we would be authentic, Father, that we would walk in this faithfulness, that we would surrender more and more each day, that we would surrender to our sanctification, that as we walk in this church and walk out, your spirit is alive and active and working no matter where we are. And in that, Lord, give us the boldness to stand firm, to stand for a Savior that the world rejects, that we would be bold in the face of, of, of adversity, and stand firm on who we know as our Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.